So welcome to our lightning talks. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five lightning talks today. So what we'll do, um, how it'll work, my name is Marissa MacDonald, and I will moderate the session for you guys. So what we're going to do is it's five minutes each for each of our presenters. Um, I will ask that you each uh, self-present or self-describe. Uh, so just say your name, where you're from, and uh, then you can begin your talk. We won't start counting until you're done your introduction. And so you've got five minutes to share. I will uh, give you a little bit of a one-minute warning when you've reached. <coughs> and then after each of our lightning talks have spoken, we will do a question and answer. So they'll remain on the stage, and you can ask any questions you might have. And without further ado, I'm going to let our first lightning talk, and we'll just begin right away. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Newson. I'm the uh, PKP Documentation Interest Group Coordinator and a Digital Projects Librarian with Scholars Portal in Toronto. And today I'm going to quickly talk to you about what's going on with PKP's documentation. So the Documentation Interest Group, or the DIG, uh, works together to create, update, and improve documentation for PKP software. And we do this primarily through documentation sprints. So documentation sprints are bi-weekly meetings that we do online for an hour and a half where we work together on documentation. Uh, so the real benefit of these sprints is that it gives us space to ask each other questions, get technical support from each other, uh, and as well as having somebody else who can uh, review what you're working on. So we decide on our tasks beforehand, uh, and then we work together on these calls to complete uh, what we've decided on. So at a sprint, we might work on a new piece of documentation, or we might be working on moving uh, documentation into the documentation hub. So this is a screenshot of the documentation hub, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, so this is the website where all of PKP's documentation is, uh, it lives. And the code and the content for the site is on GitHub and is all written in Markdown. So some of the recent highlights of Things that the documentation group has worked on recently have included the ORCID plugin guide, which we did in collaboration with ORCID, uh, a guide to DOAJ inclusion for OJS journals, which we did working with DOAJ, uh, a guide to designing your journal, so branding and typography and styling, a student journal toolkit, uh, the developer documentation hub, and a guide to upgrading from OJS2 to OJS3. Uh, so some of the things that we have coming up include OJS uh, 3.2 updates for learning OJS 3, uh, a guide to indexing in Google Scholar, a learning OMP guide, as well as an instructor guide for course journals, which was worked on at the sprint uh, for this conference. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a few ways that the community can contribute to PKP's documentation efforts. Uh, so first, you can report issues. So similar to uh, PKP software, you can also report issues for documentation uh, directly in GitHub or via email, which I'll uh, share at the end. You can submit changes. So as you're looking at PKP's documentation, and you, if you notice an issue or something that could be improved, we have these improve this page links that you uh, can click on and, and make direct changes to the documentation. You can also work on translating documentation. So currently, for example, learning OJS is in four languages, and we'd love to expand these translations to include more languages. You can create new documentation. So if you have you know, your own documentation that you've written for internal use that you think could be uh, useful for the rest of the community or something that you would lo really love to see, then we can work with you to create new documentation for the Documentation Hub. And of course, you can join the documentation interest group. So we, we do sprints uh, every, every two weeks, as I mentioned, and people can you know, join for a single sprint if there's a certain topic they're interested in, uh, or can join us for every sprint that we do. And lastly, I'd just like to point out that we have contributing guidelines, which are linked to from the documentation hub that you can review if you're interested in learning more. Thanks for your attention.
Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, we are Jan and Dennis from University Bern, Switzerland. Me, I'm working uh, for the Open Science team there. Um, I also manage the um, OGIS platform currently, which is called Bob, uh, Bern Open Publishing. Dennis himself is a subject librarian for theology, Jewish and religious studies. Today we are going to present you our planned workflow for, huma for a humanities journal that we are currently migrating to our institutional platform called um, Bob. Thank you. So, uh, in 2018, we received a message that the journal Judaica, one of the most important Jewish, Jewish studies journal published in German, uninterrupted, uh, was about to be shut down because of um, organizational and financial problems. We then approached the editors, one of them is a professor at our institution, uh, why not continuing publishing on, on Burn Open Publishing as a knee only and uh, open access journal on OGS? So that was decided. And once the decision was made that the journal will continue on Bob, we started discussion the technical um, workflow. We had a couple of goals and requirements. So. What we wanted is a different output formats, namely PDF, HTML, and XML for the lens viewer. Then we said that PDFA was high on our wish list, and um, high quality topography was also essential for us. It's a um, humanities journal. And from the very beginning, we know that we wanted a single source publishing workflow uh, outgoing from a chat's XML file. The PDFs should be produced without manual typesetting. Finally, all this should be done with free and open source software, if possible. Okay, we had two um, challenges that had to be met here. Um, or that should be mentioned here. First, um, just like many of you, we don't receive our submissions as XML files, obviously, but we receive doc, Word files, sometimes open document format. Um, so we have to cover this somehow. Um, the other thing is we, we need to deal with multilingual texts. We publish texts in German, French, English, and all of these texts contain material in Greek Hebrew, obviously, it's a Jewish studies journal. Occasionally, we have Arabic, Hebrew and Arabic running from right to left, which is an additional challenge. Um, so, these are the tools that we use. JATS XML is our production format. Jan has mentioned, already, uh, has mentioned it already. Um, the other tools are used to do the various conversion and presentation steps. Let's look how everything works together. Um, we receive a submission as a work file. I will then convert this with Pandoc to a markdown intermediate temporary file. I do some manual cleanup, add metadata, check if everything is there, if something is missing. I will polish it and then do an additional conversion step with Pandoc um, to convert it to JATXML. Here I also pull in metadata that is saved in an additional file. Um, once everything is in there, I use the lens view to, 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 to make the web presentation. We have an XSLT style sheet to produce an HTML version. And we use a tech-based typesetting tool called Context uh, to produce PDFA directly from this XML. We don't need additional tools here, um, which is very nice. Every step here is like all the commands we use are performed on the command line, and we have a make file that just automates most of it. So once a, the, the workflow is set up, you don't really have to worry about each step. You just type in make x, and it happens automatically, more or less. Yeah, that's the, the output, basically, the lens view, you know that, the HTML, and finally, here, an 
very important article, as you can see. Um, the nice thing is, as you see, the, rendered, the Hebrew is rendered correctly, also the Greek. We have um, a block quote. It's not very complicated, but at the moment it's more or less a proof of concept, but it should work. So we have to just add more of JATS elements to, to, this, to this rendering, and then we'll see how far we can go with it. Thank you. Um, we have GitHub repo, and you can just check, out, check it out and see what is currently possible and try it out. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Chevance. I come from Grenoble in France. I work as a web developer uh, at the Centre Mersenne. Uh, before mm -hmm. all, I just want to say, uh, please be indulgent with my poor English. Uh, I want to introduce the Centre Mersenne, which is a quite recent project since we launched it in, uh, 19, in uh, 2018. Uh, the Centre Mersenne is a project which offers uh, a set of publishing services and tools for Diamond Open Access journals composed uh, in LaTeX. Uh, by diamond open access, I mean uh, no cost for uh, readers and authors. So, uh, why, why, um, I don't know why. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, so, why uh, do we use LaTeX for production? Um, uh, Mad uh, the Centre Mersenne is developed by MadDuck. And uh, as uh, its name uh, suggests, MadDuck is a uh, unit dedicated to um, documentation in mathematics. Uh, among uh, uh, the services uh, developed by uh, MadDuck <coughs> was uh, the CEDRAM, uh, which is a dissemination platform for electronic journals uh, in only in mathematics. And maybe as you know, uh, mathematicians use LaTeX to compose their articles, mainly uh, for the capacity of LaTeX to uh, render formulas in PDF uh, correctly. Uh, LaTeX is pretty good uh, for time setting too. And uh, uh, we use uh, PDF for uh, publishing articles because uh, uh, we are sure of the rendering uh, uh, on the different devices and the, uh, the print version. Uh, so, uh, in, the, uh, in 2017, uh, we won a call for a project uh, to create a structure uh, supporting uh, the transition to open access. Uh, we, uh, we created the Centre Mersenne, which uh, uh, took over CEDRAM and extended the, its range of uh, services and disciplines. Uh, so, uh, the, the main objective of the Centre Mersenne is to uh, help uh, Diamond Open Access, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, is to help uh, journals uh, composed with LaTeX uh, to move to uh, Diamond Open Access. So, let's have a, a another view of our services. The first one is uh, uh, support uh, to the editorial process for each journal. Uh, for this, we make the choice of the OGS software. Uh, we adapt OGS uh, for each uh, workflow and uh, provide an instance per journal. Uh, our specificity is to use OGS uh, uh, from submission to publication, uh, for, for submission from submission to uh, production only. Uh, because uh, we have already developed our uh, publishing platform, uh, especially designed for our metadata workflow. And uh, as I said, uh, articles are uh, published only in PDF uh, for now. Uh, so these core services are free of, of, free of charge. Um, the second part of our services is optional uh, and uh, fee-based. Uh, <coughs> as you can see, typesetting is uh, an optional service, but all of our journals uh, ask for this uh, because uh, that ensures um, uh, a good visual consistency. 
uh, uh, due to our success, um, uh, we don't have enough uh, human resources to uh, achieve all the work, the job. So uh, some of these services uh, will are will be uh, outsourced, uh, like uh, typesetting. Uh, if you want uh, more information about this, uh, about uh, these services, uh, please visit our website and contact us. Uh, I'm not totally aware about uh, this part because I'm mostly technical on the te technical uh, side. Uh, so currently, uh, we have uh, more than 10 journals and six seminars. Uh, you can see here an uh, example of uh, LaTeX layout and the corresponding uh, website. Uh, during the last uh, two months, uh, we help uh, uh, French Institute to switch to a uh, non-diamond open access uh, platform to our platform. We open uh, the website uh, last Monday and uh, try to, to accept new submission uh, in uh, the beginning of December. I can't say uh, more because uh, there will soon be uh, official uh, communication. So please uh, thank you for your attention. I want to uh, thank the PKP team for all the jobs they do and the dynamic community around the, these tools. Uh, so if you want uh, more information, uh, please uh, visit our website or ask me uh, during the, uh, the break. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Charles Le Tire, and uh, I was here to present Obsidia. It's an initiative I co-founded uh, about one year ago. Um, so. What is it? Uh, I won't bother you with all the colors of open access, uh, the green, gold, and so on. I think you all know that very well. I will just focus on one we are uh, doing at Obsidia. Uh, we can be classified as diamond open access uh, since our platform is uh, with no, um, sorry, with no APC and no subscription fee. Uh, but we are also not depending on uh, public fundings for the running costs. So I will explain how. Um, what, we are, uh, what we are doing, our vision is that um, open access can be uh, seen as an opportunity and not have a cost. The scientific results has um, value, even economic value, uh, that can be, um, we can take advantage of that out of the academic circles. So we are developing two parts. One is publishing services, diamond open access services, totally free of charge, and um, text mining services that we sell to fund the publishing platform. Uh, I will give detailed example of that afterwards but I'll start with the publishing platform. Um, what are we offering to editorial committees? Um, we are offering a ready-to-use uh, platform, ready-to-use services, so they can focus on uh, their scientific work with no economic pressure. Um, we, just to say briefly, we provide hosting, support, uh, cross-posting, DOI registration, and so on. And um, we want to be very clear that uh, there is no lock-in. Um, editorial committees are totally free to come to us and to leave the platform. Uh, since the, all the publications are CCBY licensed, uh, the editorial committee remains the owner of the title of their journals. And we are based, obviously, on OGS, on an open software um, tool. So. Uh, it's, uh, there is no lock-in, and it's, it's really important if you compare to uh, most commercial publishers. Um, one thing which seems important and what is um, coming out of the discussion we have all these past days is um, that all uh, publishing tools should be tailored to reach, um, to address uh, community needs, each community needs, so there is no one size that fits all, as many of you said, 
So that's also something important for us, and so it's also something that OGS enables, and thanks for that. Uh, here is how our beta platform looks like. Feel, feel free to connect and to see how it, how it is. And now I will move to uh, the big question, uh, where does the money come from? So um, I will uh, give just one detailed example of what we are uh, developing. And uh, I hope you will, um, you, will be, you will realize two things. One is it's a sustainable mo model. We are not so crazy guys. And uh, the other thing is that we all here, as an open access community, um, are working in the benefits of the society. Um, I don't think John Wilinski is here now, but he said yesterday that uh, you want to sue the US government uh, to prove that open access is um, better for the benefits of uh, the progress of humanity and, uh, and on science. So I hope he can add the case I will present uh, to this uh, suing process. This case comes from a New York Times Tribune um, from three Liberian uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, they said that in 2014, the Ebola crisis could have been um, better prepared if, the, um, if they could have access to uh, public articles. And publishers uh, answer that it was not the case because there were too many articles and the uh, signal was too weak to be detected. So it's very, it was a very good case for us because it illustrates both of our, of our activities, which is open access and text mining services. And actually, as you can see, we <coughs> proved that there was, uh, using a um, proper tool, we can uh, detect a uh, weak signal, but not in the metadata, in the full text. So we need open access and we need tools uh, to get um, interesting results. Uh, I'll go very fast to the two other examples. One is um, technology comparator. Uh, in the case of solar cell technologies. And um, one is um, a search engine to fight uh, fake news, scientific fake news. So here is some examples of what we are developing um, as text mining services to fund uh, open access. Um, we had, as I said at the beginning, we had just uh, one year hold, and what we achieved in the first year is to have uh, half a dozen uh, editorial committee uh, project, editorial projects with different level of maturity. So we hope at the beginning of next year, we would be able to announce two or three titles. And we also have two customers for the um, intelligence tools parts. So here we are. Uh, I'll be, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. And also, if you're interested, we are hiring people. So if this adventure is uh, interesting for you, please free to come and see me. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marcel. I'm a researcher and OA officer at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. And I'm quite happy. We had a couple of conversations about uh, what I'm going to say this morning already. So um, aside from that talk, we very much hope that you whatever get in touch and we can sort of collaborate um, on sort of saving small uh, scholar-led non-APC journals. Um, Small emerging and applied research fields like internet regulation, media informatics, computational linguistics, or journalism particularly strive for a dynamic and diverse publishing ecosystem without high APCs and opaque publication processes. And whilst there's a multitude of transformation approaches and financing models for subscription-based journals, it seems that non-APC, scholar-led, OA-first journals are left alone in the deep waters of the publishing world. Thus, 
the 18 months Inno Access project at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin, together with the Leibniz Information Center for Economics in Hamburg and Kiel, takes the established open access and peer-reviewed journal Internet Policy Review as a test case and hopefully better practice. As a first step, we're currently improving Internet Policy Review's publication infrastructure with regard to a wide array of technical solutions and therefore meet current bibliometric, tracking and accessibility demands. In a second step, we're developing sustainable OA financing modules applicable to journals in interdisciplinary contexts because in those contexts, not just one disciplinary community should pay the bill. And since we believe in the strength of this particularity, connecting with our diverse stakeholders at the HIC, we're thirdly establishing long-lasting and productive networks reaching into this multiplicity of academic fields. Just wanted to elaborate a bit further on those three, um, three parts. For instance, on a technical level, we co-develop various Drupal plugins to enhance our publishing infrastructure while automatizing the editorial workflow with our OGS3 backend. As for, open access includes, as for us, open access includes inclusivity. We're implementing WCAG guidelines on an HTML and PDF level, both to make content more accessible, that is like version 2.1 on the AA compliance. And at the same time, we're discussing the use of alternative metrics together with our partners at the UOC and the Internet Interdisciplinary Institute here in Barcelona, taking into account current work and research, like with the project I want to mention, reference implementation for open scientometric indicators at the Leibniz Information Center of, for Science and Technology in Hanover, we will try to come up with solutions for contextualizing and visualizing old metrics on our journal site. In terms of financing models, something that a lot of you might be interested in, we're overcoming or try to overcome one-size-fits-all solutions and create a reusable budget toolbox for non-APC scholar-led small science journals. Assuming and hopefully proving that, auth that the author pays model cannot be the way to go, we are evaluating existing OA financing models and reflect upon alternative, fair modes of covering the actual costs of OA publishing. Eventually, this will assist, so we hope, on a practical level, how to establish and negotiate financing opportunities with their partners uh, and funding organizations. So none of this can be done alone. It rather needs to be rooted in the research and OA community. Building upon our community support so far, we will consolidate existing and establish new academic networks, for example, by bringing back research societies into the publishing responsibility and create awareness among one of our key stakeholders, that is librarians. First findings as part of the project show that there is a promising chance of uniting both societies and libraries in some sort of consortial model to support non-APC scholar-led journals. This includes also setting up incentive long-term publishing corporations and fostering a productive interdependency with research societies. As all of this is designed to scale well and be adaptable for journals beyond our journal or the context of internet research, um, no, all of this is designed that way, so there's no end. <laughs> and as articulated in the juicy call, we hope to support bibliodiversity not only in an abstract way, but rather practically encouraging smaller journals, new formats, and publishing initiatives. As all of this will be processed into transferable solutions, uh, all of this will be processed into transferable solutions to allow the research and OA community to make the best out of it. I will include a couple of links in that PDF. Those solutions include two instructive white papers on technical solutions and financing mo modules due somehow summer next year, and multiple workshops for publishing experts, librarians, and journal editors to encourage a bottom-up perspective and re-evaluate our results that in fall next year in Berlin and Hamburg. Um, for all of you interested in the details, there will be a full technical documentation on GitHub as well. I don't have the link right now. The Humboldt Institute for, Insta for Internet and Society therefore stands by its commitment to a free and sustainable dissemination of knowledge, particularly as a hub for internet research in Europe and as part of a network of internet research centers worldwide. Thanks a lot for your attention, and please get in touch if you have any questions or want to be part of it. My name is Adela, and I work for a uh, learned society in Scotland. We are a small 
heritage organization and we mostly publish research about um, Scottish history and archaeology. At the moment we have three types of publication. So we do, we have an annual journal, we have a series of open access reports and we have a list of books. Uh, the journal is quite established. It started in 1851 and there has been one volume published per year approximately since then. So as you can imagine, there's a, quite an archive of big volumes. Uh, specifically, there is, um, I think, 6,500 individual papers and more than 90% of them have been published in print. So all of that research sort of locked in there. Uh, so a few years ago, the society decided that we wanted to put all this research online into open access and to start publishing the journal electronically. Uh, we didn't have any of the expertise or infrastructure for that, so we approached Edinburgh University Library, who have been running OJS for um, student and department journals for a few years. And they, uh, they were able to set up a journal hosting platform for us that was... Uh, that is fully customized. Will it work? <laughs> no? What am I doing wrong? This is what it looks like. So uh, the university library did a sort of complete initial service for us. So they customized the website so that it looks like um, so that it corresponds to, corresponds to the style of the society website. Um, they migrated all the um, PDFs uh, from an external repository where we got them all um, scanned. They cleaned up the metadata for us and they did um, all of that work for um, a pre-agreed fee that we had with them. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing a good job with this. There we go. So yes, so there's, a, there's another list of um, customizations that they have done for us. And so we have launched this a last year, so we've had it for <laughs> one year and it's been very well received, it's been successful and we want to continue working with the library, having the service, so what we have agreed is that we're going to pay them a subscription and based on the subscription they are going to host and maintain the journal for us. So. It's a quite unusual situation where the publisher is paying a subscription to the library rather than the other way around, but so far it's been working really well for us and um, so much so actually, not only for us, but it's been working so well for the library that they have started offering the service to other organizations in Scotland. So there are now several universities and schools and I think the Royal Botanic Gardens as well. They all have their own publications um, hosted by a platform that's provided by the Edinburgh University Library. Uh, as for our, our goals, we have the full archive of our journal online now, but we have still not started publishing it electronically or taking advantage of all the different digital workflow tools in OJS um, because most of our, our production process up to now was to have um, the journal produced and typeset into a PDF externally, so we just continue to do that and upload the final PDFs there. but took the journal 150 years to get to this stage. Hopefully, um, in the near future, we will be able to start publishing it electronically as well. Uh, the other thing that the library did for us is that they set up an OMP platform for us. So, like I mentioned before, we have a list of books, and these books usually get um, published in print only, and because we're a small organization, we usually can't afford to reprint the book. So once the initial print sells out, um, we can't make the book accessible anymore. So in order to manage our backlist better, we decided that we would like to put a, a PDF of the book online into open access after the print run has sold out. And so the library set up OMP for us, again, much the same like OJS uh, did all the customization so that the websites look alike and did all the migration and the metadata cleaning. <coughs> And again, it's, it's something that we've launched just recently. It just, um, we started it in September this year, and it's been received extremely well. We've not promoted it much. We've basically just used social media. And uh, the, the main title from 2016 that we have released has been downloaded over 800 times now. And this is a lot for us because it's a monograph on a very niche topic. 
and we've published it in a run of 320 copies. So to have had 800 people download it in the space of two months is really good for um, our outreach and for, our, uh, for growing our readership. And yeah, this is all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have questions for any of our lightning talks? No questions. Oh, this one. Hi. Um, I have a question for um, you, uh, Charles. You mentioned um, that Obsidia is developing a search engine to fight against fake news? Can you develop more on the technology and if you have a workflow or a prototype on how you plan to do that? Thanks. This work? Yes. Um, yeah, a, the idea come from a, um, a journalist that has to um, he, he get a case about a protein that was uh, known to um, a cure uh, AIDS, and so he took a long time to understand if this uh, this uh, opinion, I would say, uh, was backed by scientific literature. So he had to ask uh, many experts, and what we are trying to do is to make um, a tool that is not searching for uh, specific articles because. Uh, there is, um, when you have this type of case, you would easily find one or two articles that can um, go in, uh, in, one, uh, in one side. So we are trying to have uh, tools that analyze a big corpus and say that if there is a scientific consensus, uh, if the scientific consensus is backing the claim uh, or not. Hi, um, uh, my question was for Marcel in terms of um, the particular kind of publishing stuff that you're working with. I, I may have misunderstood, but um, is kind of rapid publishing or continuous publishing or some kind of model where you're moving to publish academic work more quickly? Is that part of the project that you're working on? And, and if so, um, you know, what are some of the challenges that you found with existing platforms and workflows? Yeah, thanks again. I didn't really mention that. Um, so Internet Policy Review as a journal itself um, works in a very classic format that is um, publishing issue based. But uh, as I said, or what I try to mention is that obviously um, when you think about the, the, the challenges or the chances that come with electronic publishing, you can even rethink that. That not only means you go like the way to, towards a mega journal where you just like sort of um, uh, think in a different way, but even think about a new format, right? I mean, the, the way we distribute uh, academic knowledge these days doesn't always have to be like a 35,000 character research article that can be, and it doesn't always have to be peer reviewed, uh, like with anonymous sort of setting up. It can be like open reviewed, it can be shorter. It, uh, there's a lot of value in that as well. So we don't have an exact plan right now what uh, we will going to include, but there is, for instance, um, already a section we set up called Open Abstracts, which is a bit more fast-track publishing. You can check that out on, the, on our website, it's policyreview.info, that's the, the URL of the journal. So we're in, in close discussion with a lot of journals. Um, uh, a, a, co a friend of mine is here, a colleague, uh, we did that before. So we, we're trying to exchange and, and think about new ways to come up with you know, a new modes and ways of distributing academic knowledge. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's in an experimental stage of it. 